Hey crew, today's episode is a little bit of a mixed Amazon selling tips and explaining some things as best as I can anyways, but we're gonna be going over remote fulfillment FBA, the new rollout with Brazil. We're gonna go over multiple season and how you can send FBM products without melting, as well as the low inventory fee for FBA. So let's jump in. Hi, and welcome to Your Selling Podcast. I'm your host, Nikki Kirk, AKA Your Selling Guide. In 2017, I quit a steady corporate desk job to travel the US in an RV. Along the way, I started selling on Amazon, grew multiple successful businesses, and wound up back to my roots as a small town girl. Today, I'm still doing what I love, selling on Amazon and helping other sellers start and grow their own online businesses. Each week on Your Selling Podcast, we will cover different aspects of selling online and highlight other sellers just like you and I. From part-time sellers creating extra income on the side to full-time sellers growing million-dollar businesses. Think of this as a sit-down with your Amazon bestie where we can learn and grow our online businesses together. Welcome to Your Selling Podcast. Welcome back to another episode. So before we jump into all that, I wanted to give you a heads up. While the Dallas meetup is literally... I'm in Dallas right now. I mean, not right now, because I'm recording this back in Oklahoma, but I'm currently in Dallas when you're listening to this. So the meetup in Dallas is happening this Saturday, April 13th. If you're listening to this after or you miss it, don't worry because we're coming to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania next in June. So mark your calendars in June. I don't know the date as of right now, but I should know it more. And there will be early bird tickets up if you want to secure your spot for the Philadelphia meetup. Again, June 2024 and head to yoursellingguide.com com slash meetup to grab your tickets or to learn more about the future meetups. I'm just going to do a real chat real quick right here because as much as I love doing these podcasts and I really do enjoy them, I think they're fun. They're really much looking like my original videos were back on my YouTube channel, Nikki Kirk. So I would love to have you on a guest instead of just me sitting here talking to you because I can do that on my other channel. So if you sell on Amazon, on Walmart, on Mercury, Mercury, whatever you call it, Poshmark, eBay, Etsy, wherever it is you sell, I would love to chat with you and have you as a guest on the podcast. There is no too small of a seller. There is no too nervous of a person. Believe me, I will be nervous too and we'll do it together. So email me at podcast at yoursellingguide.com and let's have you on the podcast. Okay, so this episode, we are gonna jump into various things that have been going on in Amazon. So we're gonna start with Remote Fulfillment FBA. Amazon recently added Brazil, you probably didn't even notice, or maybe you did, added Brazil to the Americas. So the Americas have always been Canada, Mexico, and the US marketplace. All of a sudden, in the past six weeks, Brazil has been slowly rolling out to all the Amazon sellers. You probably have it on your account now. There's not really anything you need to do about it if you do, Except for, okay, wait, there's a couple things. So if you're not planning to FBM there, go ahead and go into your account settings and turn on vacation mode. That will take care of your FBM orders. The other thing you need to do is make sure you're opted out of remote fulfillment FBA if you don't wanna be. Now, all of my videos, podcasts, they're all my experience, unless it's a guest talking, but it's all my experience with selling on Amazon. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about Remote Fulfillment FBA and my experience with it and why I do not do it. I opt out of it. But let me just break down what is Remote Fulfillment FBA. Basically, it's you send your stuff into your Amazon warehouses as normal, and then Amazon is going to, if you've enrolled and you've done all your listings, you like do this thing where it like pulls the listings and then puts them out into the other marketplaces. If you've done all that, then your listings are for sale on Canada, you, uh, Canada, Mexico, and Brazil now marketplaces. Just like how Amazon added Brazil and didn't let us know, Amazon will also, well, they'll email you, but if you don't opt out, they will have auto enrolled you in FBA remote fulfillment. So if you wanna know if you are opted in or opted out, go ahead and navigate in Seller Central, go to your inventory and towards the bottom, it's like the second to the bottom now of the menu, it's called remote fulfillment FBA. There you can click on it and if it's telling you to enroll in it, then you are not currently enrolled in it. If it looks like you are already enrolled, there's already stuff there, that means you are enrolled in it and you wanna opt out. 
Unfortunately, since I'm already opted out, I don't have the steps on how to opt out of it. But if you search in Seller Central Remote Fulfillment FBA and like opt out, there is a help page with a link on how to unenroll. It's really annoying and just like Amazon to not make it easy for you to unenroll in it. But essentially all it's doing is a customer in Canada can order your products from the US warehouses and they will get it. They will pay all the import duties and all those kind of fees. It's not anything you would have to pay. And it will tell the customer like it's going to get there. So I think it says in Canada, it could take like 12 days. So it says all this when the customer is shopping on amazon.ca. Now it sounds all well and good, right? Like what's not, you know, getting more customer base. What's not to love. Unfortunately, there's a lot of things. So with remote fulfillment, Amazon is going to charge different fees like your remote or your your fulfillment, FBA fulfillment fee in the US might be one thing, but in Canada, it might be another thing. And so when you set your price, anytime after you've enrolled, so say you've opted in, opted in, or Amazon has opted you in and you didn't even know about it. Every time you add a listing to your US marketplace, it's adding it to the other countries. Issue number one pops up right away. If you sell something that you're gated in in the other countries, you can get account health dings, you can get IPs and counterfeits in those other countries. And if you're not paying attention, like me, then you won't notice those things and you'll be getting all these different emails from Amazon. Some come in Spanish, some come in French. I have to use Google Translate to understand what they're even saying. To me, it was just a huge hassle and not worth doing it. I'm sure there's YouTube videos out there that you can look for that will explain the benefits and why people love it. For me, I am already like, if I, if I have to be honest, the Amazon like account work is like my least favorite part of it. Like following up on the health cases, getting my inventory, they've lost reimbursed. Like that stuff just kind of falls to the side anyways, because I'd much rather be selling and scanning and doing all that kind of stuff. That's the fun stuff. So the account work part of it kind of is already on my back plate, right? which it shouldn't be, but it is. So adding on these other issues on top of that and really not making any extra money from selling there was not a benefit to me having creating more of this headache for me. So if you wanna try it out, by all means try it out and then you can opt out later on if you want to. For me, I ended up having, I think a customer returned something to Canada, but it returns so any kind of customer returns will come back to the US. And then you'll, it's the same process. You'll either get it back, or you can ask for it back, it'll show up in your unfulfillable if it's damaged, all that kind of stuff. So the customer, the policies remain the same. So if they can return it, they can return it. And so what happened was I got a return apparently. And then because there was no money in my Canada, like, account balance they're charging my credit card now for it and at the time my credit card was charging me more tra foreign transaction fees and again i now had to stop what i was already doing and figure out what the heck was going on with this so that's when i decided like that was it for me i was like i'm done i'm out like i don't need all this extra headache i'm just trying to sell amazon to begin with i don't want to try and figure out all this stuff so for me i was out at that point Another downside, I would say, is that Amazon is gonna charge more of the fees, like I mentioned, because they're not just gonna, out of the goodness of their heart, send stuff from the US to Canada or US to Mexico or US to Brazil. No, you're gonna have that FBA fulfillment fee that's gonna be a little bit higher to get it there. When does Amazon ever do anything out of the good of the heart for us, really? So because of that, again, more fees. Now, all of this, if, if you do it or you don't do it, it's all a part of the $39.99 professional selling fees that you pay anyways. When you start it, like I started in 2017, so there was only US, the Canada and Mexico thing happened a couple years ago. Now, if you've started after that, you're gonna see your professional fees, it will break it out by country. So I've seen new sellers tell me like, oh, I'm being charged like $13 for Mexico, blah, 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 $13 for Canada. It's all gonna be that $40, $39.99, Price, your professional selling fee membership, but you might see it broken out. Like mine, I just see the $39.99 in the US because it does with the marketplace you signed up with. So if you signed up with all three or now four, you might see it broken out like $10 each one. Either way, it will all add up to that $39.99 fee. The other thing you would need to look for if you're going to do it, I think maybe that's why I don't like it. There's a lot of reasons if you haven't picked it up, but there's a lot of reasons I don't like it. But the most important is you got to stay on top of your stuff. So once you do the remote fulfillment, you like link your listings, anything you make on your US marketplace listing, it's going to spit it out to the other marketplaces. And it's going to just do the currency conversion for the price you listed at. There are some benefits. If you have the time to dig into your other, um, 
platform. So on your Seller Central dashboard, when you see your store name at the top, it'll say US. You can click that and go to Canada, go to Brazil, and you'll see your manage inventory there. There you can price stuff. So stuff, some stuff you might be able to price higher in Canada or Mexico or Brazil if you want to. But again, now that's time you have to dig into it and figure out like, oh, can I do this? It's more manual pricing and all that kind of stuff. On the flip side of that, if you don't do that, you could be losing money through the conversion of your fees because or the conversion of the currency because maybe it's selling, you know, you're selling it for $39 here in the US, which converted to Canadian dollars is something else. And with all the different fees, you're not gonna make any money. So it very is like you have to go in and manually price the information. I don't know if there's repricers out there that do it, I'm sure there are, but you would need to make sure you're on top of your listing so that you're not losing money by selling in these other countries. And then lastly, there's different product eligibilities for all the different marketplaces. So. If you didn't know this, Canada has much more strict guidelines, especially around like beauty and food. I don't know if you guys have ever done this, but you can flip a Canadian bottle of ketchup around, look at the ingredients in a Canadian bottle, same Heinz ketchup, I mean a US bottle of Heinz and see all the ingredients. There are very different ingredients on the two different ones. So we let some things fly here in the US that is probably unhealthy for us and other countries don't. So there's a lot of restrictions. Like you will be gated in probably grocery, probably beauty if you sell in Canada from the start. And you can get ungated the same way you would here. You would get an invoice and supplier and you could do it. So if you have an invoice for the US, you could use that same invoice to ungate your Canada account. But you want to make sure all of your restrictions or all of the labelings are in fact, it's, it's again, more things that are time and thinking about that you would have to do. Like I said, I have heard, not recently, but it, when it first rolled out maybe three or four years ago, I did hear of some sellers who were making a lot of money by selling in these other countries. So it's all a time and effort on your part. Do you want to take the time and learn it and potentially grow your business there? Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. I'm just here to share the information and why I don't like it. I have gotten IP complaints. I sold a, um, what's the brand? Was it Hertz? That doesn't sound right. Glad? It was an orange solo cup, basically, but it was one of the brands of them. And I wasn't selling it in Canada, but because I think I was opt-in at the time, it was like around Halloween, probably three years ago, I was selling the solo cups that were orange. And I was selling them in the US, but of course, because I list products in the US and I was already opted in, it's filtering out all of my listings to the other countries. So I ended up last year getting an IP or counterfeit or some restricted, something happened on my account. And I was like, I thought I opted out of this. And it was like a huge thing. I had to figure it all out and get rid of, like delete all the inventory again. And it did come off my account. But this was a hassle I didn't want and didn't need, right? So that's why I've opted out of it. Again, I know this is very like negative and blah. I don't like it, so I'm just gonna tell you the truth about it. But I'm sure, like I said, there's probably a lot of YouTube videos out there of sellers who do use it. But the one thing I wanted you to know is about Brazil, so how they've rolled it out. So definitely make sure you set FBM to vacation mode and make sure you've opted out of the enrollment for it if you haven't already. I did see in the beginner FBA course group that there are, so if you go to your manage inventory, remote fulfillment FBA, there are some things where you have to click the little box and like say, yes, I do not want to be in this. Otherwise it's gonna opt you into it, I think in the middle of April. So definitely check it out. If you're unsure about where you stand, it doesn't hurt to take a couple minutes and log into your seller account and just make sure everything is how you want it to be. Hey crew, is your Amazon business set up for success this year? Do you know how much profit you really made on the item you just sold? Or what about this? Do you notice when the Amazon FBA fees change on a product in your inventory? These are just some of the reasons why I love Sellerboard and why I've partnered with them on the Your Selling Podcast. I have been using Sellerboard for four years now and I absolutely do not know how I will run my business without it. I love how simple Sellerboard is to use. The desktop version is set up so easy as soon as you connect your Amazon account, all of your products from the past, anything you've ever sold is gonna flow into that. And the way I love it and use it the most is actually when I'm outsourcing. I have Sellerboard app right on my phone and I can visually see the images of the products I'm selling today, yesterday, last month, last year, whatever I wanna look at, I can see it in real time right on my Sellerboard app. Sellerboard is an affordable must have tool for all Amazon sellers. And as listeners of this podcast, they have given you two months free 
to try it out for yourself. There's absolutely no credit card required to sign up and you can cancel at any time. Head to yoursellingguide.com slash sellerboardprofit to set up your free trial today. Again, yoursellingguide.com slash sellerboardprofit to get your two month free trial today. Okay, this podcast is like a squish of like bad thing, great thing, bad thing. So now we're in the good part. What is it, like an Oreo sandwich? So we are gonna talk about meltables now. So meltable season is here, or next week is here. If you wanna know if any of your ASINs are meltable, head to yoursellingguide.com slash meltable, and it will tend send you to the page where Amazon has an Excel file of ASINs, and you can check if your ASINs are listed on there. If they are, meltable means you cannot send anything meltable into the Amazon warehouses for FBA during the summer months. So it comes from April 15th to October 15th or 16th or somewhere in there. So basically after Easter, which we are now, you can no longer send stuff in FBA. It actually won't even let you in, in, in Inventory Lab and in um, Seller Central or however you do it. It won't even let you send the ASINs in. But that does mean that you can make some killer profit selling FBM with these multiple items. One note here, even if Amazon lets you send something in, say a gummy vitamin is not on Amazon's flag list, do not send it into the warehouse because it will melt. So if you think or you know it's gonna melt sitting in your car all day, it is going to melt in the UPS truck and the Amazon warehouses, all these things that apparently are not AC, although I did hear that UPS is getting AC now. But anyways, all these things that are gonna potentially melt and that's why Amazon has this policy because you don't want your customer leaving you bad feedback or a return because the item melted. So make sure, use your better judgment. If you think it can melt, don't send it in Amazon, send it yourself using Seller Fulfilled or FBM. Okay, so it's not actually a whole lot of prep to do FBM. So actually on Amazon, you can get these little, they're like um, little pillow, packets of ice packet. They actually come dry. You soak them in water. You can throw them in a bowl. Each sheet has 24 on it, so you can cut them up into smaller ones. If you're sending like a bag of candy, just cut one, freeze it, throw it in with the item, and there you go. Your item isn't going to melt. So you're going to want ice packs. You're going to want thermal mailers, and if you have stuff that you're sending in a box from Uline or even probably on Amazon, you can get thermal like liners. They're like um, foamy and then they have the foil thermal part on the outside you could just shove that in a box put in a couple ice packs and then off you go you're good to go thermal mailers so they they just look like your standard poly or not poly what are those things padded mailers that we can send stuff for fbm the same thing all of these supplies are at yoursellingguide.com slash supplies it links to my amazon store page where i have all this thing so i have the little ice packets that you can cut up so those ice packets you can get a each sheet has 24 and you can get six pack for 10 bucks. That's like seven cents a little pack. And they're like probably two inches by an inch or something. So you can cut out like maybe you're sending something small, you only need one or maybe something, something a little bit bigger, you want three. Now with the ice packs, I would recommend poly bagging the ice pack or otherwise wrapping it maybe in tissue paper. That way the moisture doesn't get onto the item you're sending, it stays with it. So definitely poly bag the ice pack to keep it, you know, all the moisture inside of that and not on your product. But all you have to do is get the poly mailer, which they come, the thermal poly mailers, you can get a pack of, I think, 25 for 25 bucks, so a dollar each. So just buffer in that extra shipping cost, that prep cost for the meltables. But the great thing is that there's not a lot of sellers who do meltables because it's a little bit scary. And so they, you will have less competition and potentially be able to make a lot more profit. So throw in an ice pack and a thermal mailer and then the last tip for this would be, while we're always trying to get it to the customer, you know, the cheapest way possible, maybe you wanna go a little bit more and get it there faster possible if it's a meltable, if it's like a solid, like it's a Hershey's Kiss, or I don't know if those melt actually, probably they do, but something that is like gonna melt, like a solid chocolate or a Harry and David chocolate truffle, that's gonna melt. So you would wanna send that, you know, maybe a little faster, maybe not. Definitely look in Amazon and see how fast it's gonna get to the customer and put in enough meltable or ice packs so that it will get there without melting. If something is like, I use like granola bars, like chewy granola bars where they are just a little bit chocolate on the bottom, obviously that chocolate is gonna melt and can make a mess, but it's not a whole like solid, 
thing that's going to melt everywhere. So use your better judgment. And at the end of the day, be prepared to refund a customer if they sell it melted. That is one of the, um, downsides to meltable is you might do everything you can and it still doesn't get there. Just learn from it, make some changes. Maybe you're going to charge for shipping now because you need it to get there faster. So the customer is going to have to pay for the expedited if they want it because you need to get it to them. You don't want it meltable. And just remember that FBM feedback, seller feedback is a little bit harder to take off. It's actually a lot harder to take off. So you want to make sure you're packing everything as best as possible. So thermal mailers, throw the ice packs in there, make sure they are poly bags so it's not going to get on the product and make sure that you are making all that profit with FBM meltables because it's a great time of year to sell and make a lot of profit. If you're scared, go down like the Atkins bars, like things that are chocolate but not solid chocolate and try your hand at it. Gummies, vitamin gummies, those are also great, easy to send, throw in a... Uh, ice pack with it, off it goes, make that money this meltable season. Okay, the last topic is the new low stock Amazon fee. So this one is tricky. I'm not gonna say I'm an expert because I don't know what it's fully gonna look like just yet, but I'm gonna tell you what I know and how hopefully it will help answer some of the questions around it. So the first thing is this is only for FBA items. So if you wanna see, you can see the historical days of supply. So it takes the historical days of supply 30 days and 90 days and whichever is greater and you want it to be greater because the low stock is what gets the fee. Whichever is greater is how they use it. In your inventory menu, go to FBA inventory. And if you're like me, this is gonna be a totally new, like I don't go to this screen all the time because I just go to my manage inventory screen. So when you're there, it's on mine, it's like the fourth column. So I think it's there for everyone, but if you don't see it, unhide it or manage your column so you can see it. It's called Historical Days of Supply Parent ASIN. Now, first things first, the Parent ASIN is very important. If you are on a listing of Crocs that have 500 variations between sizes and colors, it's usually the number one shoe, it's gonna take in the parent level, not the child, which is the variations. So as long as it, it can, I don't even know how to explain this properly, but since it's using the higher up, as long as that higher up, like days of supply, so if you have one that's not really selling and then there's you have another one that's selling a lot, but they're both under that same parent, if you don't have enough of this one that's selling a lot, that fee is going to hit the other one that's not really selling. If that, I don't, like I said, I'm not an expert on this, but hopefully that made sense. The low inventory fee is forward facing. So if you do not make a sell on an item, you're not gonna get that fee. Well, that's one of the good things. So if your product is not selling, you're gonna have over 28 days of supply. So you don't have to worry about it because if you're above 28 days, there's no fee. It's when you get below 28 days, below 21 days and below 14 days that a fee applies. You can see all these fees if you search in your Amazon Seller Central, Amazon low inventory fees. It has a whole page and breakdown. Since it's forward facing, anything it's like, so it's enacted April 1st, it's anything forward. You're not gonna get retroactive fees on stuff from the past. And if you're out of stock on something, you can't get any fees cause you can't, you get the fee when you sell it. So if you are out of stock or if you're worried about like, oh no, should I delete my old inventory? Don't worry about it cause you're not gonna get a fee cause it's not selling, it's forward facing. So you have to have the product and it has to sell before you'll even see the fee. If you have a product that's sitting at the warehouse, not selling, again, it's not selling so you won't get the fee, but also it's gonna have over 28 days of supply so you won't get the fee. As of right now, Amazon is calculating that fee or your days of supply on a seven day. So every seven days, it's gonna recalculate it. So if you were to drop below 21 days on an item, you're gonna get that fee for every time it sells that week until it gets more stock in from you or until the Amazon seven day feed goes again. And now it's like, oh, okay, now they have 28 days. So you're not going to get a fee. So just that it's once you drop below, you're going to be at least for a week, if unless you have stuff that's getting checked in and in route. And it does, it has to be checked in and in your, like in reserved, it has to be somewhere in Amazon warehouse. They don't take into effect the inbound inventory. Okay, so I'm looking at my Amazon FBA inventory page and in this historical days of supply, they're not there for everything, but you'll see like on this example, I have 87 of them. There are 87 days of supply for it. And you can see on my breakdown short term, I have 87 the last days of 
days of supply for the last 30 days. Long term, 90 days, I only have 18 days of supply. So it's taking the greater of them. So 18, technically, if it was going off of my 90 days, then I would be under. But because I have short term 30, it's taking the greater of them. So 87, this one is not at risk. This other one, which I'm out of stock now, but you can see it is highlighted in the same column, it's red. So now I see I have 13.4 days of supply between short term and long term. This is a calendar that I sent in last month, a couple weeks ago, and hey, funny note, calendars, 2024 calendars sell in March and April, but I just did a test order and they all sold right away. So now, because I don't have any anymore, I'm not gonna get that fee. But if I were to send it in, I would be getting a fee because of that days of supply. So I would have to send enough to cover. So I think I sent in 26, but the, or sorry, it's telling me to send in 26. So on this FBA inventory screen, you should look at what the min level is that Amazon is recommending. This is all like a very fluid thing. The feed just rolled out until it's fully like here and how we see how it works. I'm not really gonna know more. And honestly, I'm not really an expert in digging into all these different things that happen on Amazon. I just look at my numbers and my profit using seller board and say, did this thing make money? Okay, great, let's replen it. And yeah, I gotta say, I love seller board for that because it will help me know truly after all these random fees Amazon keeps throwing at us this day or this year, if I'm gonna make any money with this item I'm selling on Amazon. So I got, I love seller board for that. So definitely dig into your own account and see about those historical days of supply to see what products, because you might be worried about it and freaking out and see that you only have like one product that it's even affecting. Of course, to not pay the fee, we would just keep restocking and replanning as much as possible. But once you drop below, if you have a couple items, unless you're going to FBM the stuff, you might be getting this additional fee. And it's not all that expensive. It's like a dollar if you have the biggest item at the lowest rate. So 14 days or less, and it's like a oversized large item, you're going to get a dollar charge. I think it's like 96 cents. So it's not that much of a fee and how it's going to affect long term. We will see because it just rolled out. Hope this episode was helpful. It was like a crazy day for me, yay. So anyways, I hope you enjoyed it. And, and as I mentioned, I would love to have you as a guest on the podcast. So please email me at podcast at yoursellingguide.com. It comes to me, I'm the one who gets it. I'm the one who emails you back and schedules you. And I would love to chat more. Until next week, happy sourcing.